This video is brought to you by Squarespace. The police say we're not trying to kill music, this is just common sense, they're trying to stop murder. From the decaying ashes of the chav, in the early to mid 2010s, a brand new subculture was emerging. One that was much more violent, much more organized, and much more controversial. The Roadmap. Tensions between the UK authorities and the Roadman grew and grew and grew, eventually leading to laws being passed banning the music they held sacred. UK drill. Today, we will explore the Roadman subculture. All black North faces, puffer jackets, shotter bags, Nike Air Max 97s, and they're extremely complex and widely enjoyed slang. You know what, anytime I see you, I'm gonna lick off your face. Um, don't think they actually mean lick off your, no. Roadman culture is very interesting. It's become massively influential on the wider mainstream culture, even outside of the UK. But before Drake started dressing in Stone Island, the Roadman's origins came from the old dying subculture of the Chav. Now I made a whole video about that, if you haven't seen it, I'll link it below. But effectively the Chavs were like the underclass of British society. They were known for being troublemakers, very antisocial, very criminal. But by the end of the 2010s, the Chav era really came to an end. But fear not, quietly in the underground in the 2000s, culture, a brand new subculture was emerging, and it all starts with music. Grime was a genre of music in the UK that evolved from the electronic genre of garage. Yeah, it was pretty similar, but instead of having Daniel Bedingfield emotionally singing how he's gotta get through this, I gotta get through this. You had Wiley rapping about how he was gonna lay a man down. He's the godfather of grime. For two decades, Wiley has been an influential figure in British culture. Wiley is often credited as like the godfather of grime. What's interesting about Wiley at that time is that he had a very unique way of speaking, a different accent. Before you can hear me, you can hear me but I'm speaking uh, in a London accent. As London's ethnic demographic changed over the last 20 to 30 years, a very specific way of speaking and accent started to pop up around about the 80s and 90s, which now some people refer to as the multicultural London English accent. He thought it was on a girly commercial thing and man was on a hardcore grime road thing. He's thing what fit a man's thing. It's basically a mix of like traditional Cockney geezer accent. I don't remember nothing. I was obviously smashed out of me tree. Combined with elements of Jamaican patois. Let's talk to my girlfriend to me and myself and you saying boy, we're good. This combination would go on to develop the very iconic roadman dialect that we hear today. How do we say hello? One, one. one. <laughs> British. One more those man's gonna kick you out there like a soccer ball. But you see, on top of just speaking different, there was also a far more edgier attitude that came with what we would now call the Roadman. An attitude that was more aggressive, more in your face, more bravado. And you can really hear this in the lyrics of Grime. Often rapping about money, cars, girls, partying. These young men who existed in very poor conditions were trying to find ways of gaining respect in their community. Respect that was often withheld from the wider British public. And so, pretty understandably, they weren't very happy about that. And you could hear that in the lyrics of Grime. These will make man run for their lives. By the mid to early 2000s, we were getting closer and closer to what we could call a roadmap. But something was missing. And that was the fashion. I think this was most evident in the music video for Game Over by Tinchy Strider. So the track starts with gigs and we see him wearing this outfit that sort of looks like he didn't know what he was dressing for. Like he could have been going out for a pint of his mates, attending a baseball game or going on a dinner date. And then we jump over to Devlin who's dressed as if he's just come from beating up away fans at a football match. And then finally you got Tinchy Strider who has so much jewellery on him it looks like he ran out of money for the rest of his outfit. And so as you can see, the fashion was lacking. But now it was the early 2010s and grime had actually reached a very low point. After its massive success, the sound became very commercialized and tried being sold to a mainstream audience. It started to sound very inauthentic and grime just lost its popularity and it really died down. But that would all change in 2014 with the second coming of grime. Meridian Dan dropped the tune German Whip. See man driving a German Whip. Now every single lad outside of a McDonald's was playing this tune at full blast. Skepta released two tunes in particular that started doing really well, which is That's Not Me. No, that's not me. And shut down. That's not me and it shut down. Whereby in both tunes, he was very specifically talking about fashion and why he changed how he dressed. Because of copyright, I'm gonna have to perform the tunes for you. Yeah, I used to wear Gucci, but I put it all in the bin. 
because that's not me. True, I used to look like you, but dressing like a mess? Nah, that's not me. And then you got the other tune. Fashion week and it shut down. Went to the show sitting in the front row in a black tracksuit and it shut down. This sportswear roadman aesthetic was being popularized by Skepta. So much so that in 2015, Skepta did a fashion model walk in Milan, dressed head to toe as a roadman. As well, Stormzy was becoming a massive artist and he would often dress like a roadman. And then something insane happened. Before we go any further with this video, I want to give a massive shout out to Squarespace for sponsoring. Squarespace is the number one platform for building and developing your own website. Whatever it is you do, whether you're a graphic designer, maybe a business consultant, having a great looking website is super important for reflecting the quality of your work. With Squarespace's easy to use platform and tons of templates for you to pick from, you can pick and customize them to fit exactly what it is you do perfectly. And there's tons of tools built in like email marketing, e-commerce, members only content and much more. I've been using it on this project I'm currently working on that's coming out soon and genuinely it's really fun and very easy to do so be sure to check out squarespace at www.squarespace.com forward slash jimmy the giant and to get 10 percent off your first purchase of a website or a domain use the code jimmy the giant anyway back to the video i saw this guy and he had his hoodie on and his glasses and i i couldn't believe the pockets that he was finding and the consistency of his flows and just the choices that he was making drake for whatever reason just absolutely fell in love with the uk he would come out unannounced to underground grind events. He would collaborate with grime musicians and there was endless jokes and memes about how Drake turns into a roadman every time he goes to England. Man's never been in marquee when it's shut down, eh? Trust me, daddy. But you see, as funny as this was, it was very beneficial to the UK music scene and the roadman culture. But you see, this is where things start to get dark. Around 2013, a new genre of music was emerging from Brixton in London, with two gangs called 150 and 67. They were from a very rough area and were very involved in the gang world. This genre was called UK Drill. Now look, Grime was also very gang heavy, talking about selling drugs, violence, etc. But Drill took it to another level, from the dark, evil sounding instrumentals, to the lyrics talking about specific gang murders, showing weapons on camera, and basically showing off this lifestyle. Now the two groups, 150 and 67, had beef. This would be considered the first ever UK drill beef. But things would start to change on February 24th, 2015. Now 6-7 and 150 have been sending for each other over music, but it would be on this day where a member of 150 called SQ would be stabbed to death by a member of 6-7. Around the same sort of time, a member of 6-7 called Scribs was starting to actually blow up in the music industry. But you see, Scribs was a naughty boy. He was involved in lots of criminal cases, and these cases resulted in him receiving a ASBO, an antisocial behavior order, where in 2014, the police banned him from making and performing music. But you see, Scribs was a very inventive man. He was able to scuttle his way around the band by changing his name to LD and wearing a face mask. In 2014 to like 2017, UK Drill was really, really blowing up. It had very much developed its own sound separate to the Chicago Drill scene. And it was finding success in the mainstream world of music. You couldn't escape it. Every single roadman driving around a Vauxhall Corsa selling weed would be blaring out drill beats. And so this was the final piece of the puzzle for the roadman culture to truly take over. It seemed as though everyone loved drill, except for the police. The police were starting to link drill to escalating gang violence that was happening in the streets. These violent stabbings and shootings would happen after drill rappers would send for each other over tracks. One guy would kill one person and then talk about it in a track, and then another person would send a track back and then go and kill him. And it started to get out of hand, to the point where the police took very extreme measures. Today, a judge banned five young drill artists from performing or uploading songs that incite violence. Five rappers from the group 10, 11, were banned from making music altogether. The ruling is significant, thought to be the first time a modern day ASBO has been used to censor art. What they were specifically being banned from doing was mentioning in their lyrics death or injury and from mentioning named postcodes in like a gang related context. If any of these members wanted to make a new song, they had to run it by the police 24 hours before releasing it. As well, they had to give 48 hours of notice to the police of the date and location of any performance or any filming of a music video and have police on site at the time. Firstly, apologies to all the fans 
plans are in Germany right now. Obviously, can't make it there. Fed summoned me and Skengdo to court. As well, two other drill rappers called Skengdo and AM had actually received a two-year suspended sentence for performing the band song Attempted 1.0. Now, you may be wondering what led the police to take these extreme actions. Around 2017, there had been a massive wave of knife crime. It had been the highest it had been in a very long time and a 22% rise. This sparked a debate whether drill had anything to do with this rise in knife crime. Because it did seem a little coincidental that the height of drill being a genre that talked about stabbing and murdering just so happened to be at the exact same time of this massive knife problem. The OG drill group 6-7, who was starting to do really well in the mainstream world, effectively had their entire first ever tour cancelled. And this was because the venues were scared of hosting them, due to a separate legal precedent which was called Form 696. Form 696 was created in 2005 and it required venues like nightclubs to hand over details to the authorities around who was performing at an event, what genre of music they produce, the target audience of that music and their ethnicity. As you can imagine, this received quite a bit of criticism. It was seen as discriminating against rap, grime and other underground black led genres. In 2010, gigs had a show cancelled under Form 696. JME also had a show cancelled, which led to him making a whole documentary on this controversy. But I'm starting to get concerned that what we do is slowly being strangled by London's police. And in particular, a form I keep hearing about called the 696. I was booked to play at Just Jam at the Barbican with Big Nasty in February, but following police advice, it was cancelled the day before without a valid reason. There is a clear link between these drill videos, as they're called, and very serious violence. Even though they sound sinister, they're really saying, come to my neighbourhood, see what's going on. The police say, we're not trying to kill music, this is just common sense, they're trying to stop murder. When we're trying to go to other venues now, it makes it hard. When you go to venues and they turn around and say, no, just because the police have kind of threatened them with revoking their licence. Yeah, it's a, it's a piss take, isn't it? Jump forward now 10 years to drill and Form 696 as well as these ASBOs were being used to suppress this music. But you see, the ban had the opposite reaction to what was intended. This controversy around drill only made drill cooler. It was now countercultural. it was rebellious. It was this authentic street culture. A lot of these young people are disenfranchised and they are rapping about what they see, not necessarily what they are going to do. So it's too simplistic to say that because of this genre of music, there is a rise in knife and gang crime. And so this debate grew and grew around free speech. The question being something around what is the definition of inciting violence? Does free speech protect that? If I jumped on a UK drill beat and said, I'm going to stab Bob outside of McDonald's at 10 p.m. on Friday, I release that song and then go and do that thing. Can the police use those lyrics as evidence in court? And furthermore, and much more controversially, can the police stop me from putting those lyrics out out there because it might lead to real life violence. This became a big deal and people did research into it from the University of London, where they argued that the authorities' attempts to suppress speech were misguided and actually led to more harm. Even though their narratives are causing chaos in those communities, what they're talking about is a reality that society mm. don't want to deal with. And for me, this is where we need to shift the discussion mm. to. Not just blaming and banning and censoring young people, but why really are you carrying knives? Why really are you carrying guns? To me, banning drill completely misses the point. All it does is target a symptom of a much deeper problem. These are usually young men who grow up in these communities surrounded by violence, poverty, and come from broken homes. Often the only masculine role models that they can find are people who are in gangs, like older dudes, who people fear and respect. And so they see that as the only route for them to receive respect in this world too. What's really ironic is many of the rappers who make it out of this lifestyle and are successful often grow up into wanting to be these powerful, positive role models for these younger dudes. They want to show that it is possible to live a different life and get out of them. I mean, for example, Stormzy, he's always talking about his faith in God and his attitude to rising out of the world he came from. And like, sure, drill and roadman culture definitely did glamorize violence. It probably did make things worse. But it isn't the problem itself, it's just a symptom of the problem. You have to assess what drives these men into these lifestyles and fix those problems, and not just simply ban their self-expression. When we was young or before this music, there wasn't really a vision to like, see anything outside of here. But now I'm sure like, a lot of more people have hope, and um, a lot more examples of people that have made steps further away from this place. If you enjoyed this video, be sure to leave a like and subscribe to the channel and watch this video right here.